Was it legit? Cause I've been with you every day Some waterfalls I stop believing in some kind of miracle And I've been staring at the sun For too damn long But when I opened up the door To let me back to the What's up seekers welcome back to the channel man um you guys already know what we do man but if you don't we break down scary and creepy videos man on and now on the web from youtube videos to tiktok videos to ig videos facebook facebook clips anything weird usual unexplained you can find right here on this channel just like i said when i thank the seekers man who's been tapping in who's been tapping in with us man summing up to the channel i appreciate that like i said let's keep that train rolling found this video for you guys today let's see what we do best seekers Seek the truth. Rochester, New York in the 1940s. The party was being thrown by Jack and Amelia Layton, and they actually noticed that this guest was outside of the party watching the guests through a window. The report claims mm -hmm. that Amelia believed the guest was her friend Jan, who tended to go above and beyond for Halloween, creating very scary costumes. So she let this person in believing it was her friend Jan. But then 20 minutes later, Jan shows up, and that guest could not be found anywhere. So Amelia starts running around the party asking everyone if they knew who that guest was and no one had recognized that person. So she goes into mm. her daughter's room who was playing while the party was happening. And the police report states that the only thing there left of Amelia's daughter was a bloody shoe. Four other reports of this guest being at parties that night were called into police and all of them resulted in missing children's cases. The identity of this person has never been found and none of the kids have been found either. This fam- Seekers, bro. So you gotta be freaking careful, man. If we let in your freaking house, bro, like if you have a party or something, man, I'm gonna have to stop, stop him at the door, check him out, bro. She just assumed it was her friend, and look what freaking happened, bro. But the head that they said she hit up, like that person went to other parties too, man, took all those freaking kids. See, cause we're going to dive into that case, bro, cause that's just freaking mind blowing, man. Went to that many parties, bro, and people they couldn't figure out who it was, and no connections. It's fishy, man. Emily in Texas was living with a haunted Elsa doll for years. That's what happened to Emily's daughter who received an Elsa doll from her grandmother when she turned one. The family kept the doll for a few years until it started speaking on its own even when the switch was turned off. Emily also said that after two years, the doll suddenly began speaking Spanish, which is weird because it only spoke English the entire time they had it. In 2019, Emily decided to throw Elsa in the trash because at this point, her daughter had this doll for a very long time. But two weeks later, Matt opened a wooden bench in their living room and Elsa was in there. Obviously, he was confused, so he asked his kids if they had brought Elsa back into the house, and they said no. So this time, Matt and Emily put Elsa into two garbage bags and watched as the garbage truck picked up their garbage and took it away. But it doesn't end there. Two weeks later, their daughter casually told them that she saw Elsa in their backyard. So when she went outside, she saw Elsa there. And at this point, Emily was freaked out and she decided to send Elsa to a friend 2,400 kilometers away with no return label. Emily said that since the doll's been gone, there has been weird things happening in their home, such as light turning on and off and doors opening and closing. So do you guys think Elsa was haunted or is there another explanation for all of this? See, cause I'm gonna need you guys here to put chime in your thoughts on that one, bro. Was that, you know, Elsa doll, man? The other guys believe in those freaking spirits and stuff like that. They didn't get to me. It's like they kept freaking throwing it in the trash and it just somehow just kept coming back. I don't know, like I said, somebody's trying to play a prank on them or it generally just out of coincidence, it literally just landed back where it started. That same when they sent it away, man. It's like the freaking house got haunted or something, man. It's freaking strange, bro. I don't think somebody's playing a prank. That might be some bad energy over there or something like that. See, because what do you guys think? If you see black eyed children, don't let them in. According to legend, black eyed children are believed to come to your house, to your vehicle window if you're alone at the parking lot into places where there aren't many people. When they appear, they often say, 
that they need help with something and that you must let them in. They must enter, whether it is in your car or at your house. Anyone who encountered them has almost immediately felt an overwhelming sense of dread. If you don't let them in, they become increasingly insistent that they need to be allowed in. The kids have pale skin and black eyes. Apart from their blacked out eyes, these children seem normal. Nobody knows why or how these kids appear. Some suggest that these children have existed since the 1980s, although most sources state that the legend originated around 1996. But remember, do you ever see a picture that just makes your stomach drop? This is a still from an alert that a woman named Alexis Randall got on her phone. It's from a security camera that was set up in her living room, but she's looking at this and she's thinking the same thing you are. She's like, what's wrong with the picture here? Why did the motion detector go off? But then look a bit closer, specifically at the bathroom door. This man was staring at the camera from the doorway. She spots this picture and she immediately panics and calls the police, but by the time they get there, this guy is gone. What really freaked her out even more is that when police got there, they found evidence that the bathroom window had been tampered with. Further security footage would show that the man had crawled through the bathroom window the night before and was hiding in the hallway bathroom all through the night, even while she was in the house. And if you guys are loving creep time, make sure to go follow on it. Seekers, man, what did you guys freaking do, bro? You saw a freaking picture like that, man. A man in your freaking house the whole time by your bathroom, bro. You have no idea. That's scary, bro. That, like, somebody can have access to your house like that and they could be in there for that long and you don't, and you don't pick it up. Like, what happens if she tried to go back to the bathroom, man? Something could have had happened. And they found evidence that the window was tampered with, so he's definitely there, bro. See, because what would you guys do in a situation like that, man? I am about to have me freaking chipper check in my bathroom, too, bro. But probably <laughs> you go to the bathroom today, man. Skinwalkers. But see you guys comment about that down below. These normal objects have disturbing backstories. First up, did you know that treadmills have a terrifying backstory? Nowadays, we use treadmills to exercise, but back then they were used for something much darker. Mm. Over 200 years ago, treadmills were invented in England as a prison rehabilitation device. Specifically, they were used to punish oh. prisoners to the point where some of them actually passed away from exhaustion. Next up, we have the very disturbing backstory of Fantas. We've probably all had or at least seen a bottle of Fanta before, uh -huh. but this soda was actually originally created for because other sodas, including Coca-Cola, was no longer available in Germany during World War II. And last on this list, we have chainsaws, which were originally invented for childbirth. In the year 1780, two doctors invented the chainsaw to remove parts of the pelvic bone, and this was to make childbirth less time-consuming. Let me know if I should make this a series and follow for more. Seekers, bro, what facts got shot if he almost shook? I think to me, man, it has to be about the chainsaws, bro. Like, what the hell? You wouldn't think, man, when somebody came with a chain shake, you would never in a million years think that it, it was me for childbirth. Oh, what the hell? Go to show you, guess how far we progress, man. And the thing about Fanta's, bro, because you know, yeah, we. Fanta, man, used to be, um, used to drink that all the time, but you know, I cut out the sodas, but. It's freaking crazy, bro. 
that it was made, I guess, for Germany because Coca-Cola's running a lot over there. The more you know secrets, man, like I said, bro, when I watch these videos, man, always expands my mind. That's why I gotta stay up to date, bro. What's that girl doing? What the? Edit, edit seekers? Or is it legit? Cause I've been with you every day Some waterfalls I stopped believing in some kind of miracle And I've been staring at the sun For too damn long But when I opened up the door Like any other teenage girl, when she was 16, she fell in love and began a romantic relationship with a boy who happened to live on the farm next door. The boy's parents weren't fond of their relationship, and it really went south when they found out their plans to marry a couple years later. They believe that Rhoda may be involved in witchcraft, a tale that dated back to her grandmother, Mary Derry of Pennsylvania. The stories surrounding her grandmother frightened Rhoda, and matters were only made worse when the boy's mother came to her and told her to stay away, and if not, she would curse her. Mm -hmm. This is when things went south for Rhoda. She had a severe mental breakdown and eventually grew to believe that an evil spirit called Old Scratch was haunting her. She was hospitalized, but was deemed incurable, so she was returned back home to her parents. Her parents tried to care for her, but it became too much, so she was sent to Adams County Almshouse when she was 25 years old on September 3rd, 1860. The almshouse was known for treating patients inhumanely, and for four decades, Rhoda was subjected to horrific conditions. Mm. A report from the General Assembly in 1881 indicated that Rhoda spent most of her time naked inside of a wooden box filled with straw. Her excrement filled the box, and mice built nests around her. Rhoda sat in the box in a crouched position with her knees up to her chin. Because she sat in this position for so long, she eventually lost movement in her legs. She was constantly moving as well. So she had bruises all over her body. She even punched her face and knocked out her teeth as well as gouged out her eyes. To make matters even worse, Rhoda could not speak. In 1904, she was sent to Bartonville Asylum. She was bathed daily and slept in a bed for the first time in decades. On October 9th, 1906, the day before her 72nd birthday, she passed away. Rest in peace, Rhoda Derry. Life can get tough, chills in my bones. Working too much, weight on my soul. Closing my eyes, let it all go. The least I can do. Jeffrey Donald wore these handcuffs when he was in prison. And I'm sure they have to make it up in the And Jeffrey Dahmer also signed this piece of paper. And just around the corner from these Jeffrey Dahmer items are John Wayne Gacy's original spots. This place is scary. I just know I'm gonna see that if we keep moving our feet, we'll find a way, find a way. In today, in today. Has been accused. Did y'all see that man? She scooped that dog up, bro. Perfect catch, man. That guy was looking like, what the hell is going on, bro? She's lucky, man, that she caught that dog, bro. That could have freaking ended very badly for that dog seekers, bro. Bro. Hmm. But how did he even get out? How did he even get to that edge in the first place? Hmm of committing horrible crimes against his nine adopted sons. I'm about to nine. talk about a lot of things, but I honestly think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Since 2017, Hayim Cohen has documented his life online as a single Orthodox Jewish man raising his nine adopted sons. On two TikTok accounts and a YouTube channel, he posted to hundreds of thousands mm. of people. In 2019, Cohen was charged with indecency with a child after an exchange student from Spain stayed with him and was essayed. Despite that charge, Cohen was allowed to keep his nine adopted sons who ranged from 4 to 14 at the time. 
by the way, these weird number one dad edits were posted to his Facebook and I think that he made them, not his children. On January 30th of this year, one of the sons made an anonymous call into a podcast. For 45 minutes, the boy told this host of Blind Skin Beauty that he was being essayed by his adopted father, mm -hmm. that his brothers were as well, and that they were scared to come forward. He said they were in fear of their lives and that Child Protective Services had been to their home eight times. But Cohen would bribe or scare the children into staying quiet. The podcast host knew that this boy lived in Texas, but nothing else. But after two days and at least 200 phone calls, she finally tracked the family down. Mm. Thanks to Cohen's large social media presence, it wasn't hard. She filed a police report, and they found out that the boy had called from Cohen's home via his IP address. Within a couple of days, Cohen was arrested for essaying his son. After interviewing all the children, at least five more have come forward about the essay. And two weeks ago, Cohen was faced with nearly a dozen new charges. It's been reported that this abuse has been going on for at least six years. He also allegedly beat them with belts and doused them with pepper spray, among other horrible things. Cohen's identity is also being called into question. In interviews, he's claimed to be raised Jewish in New York City, but he was actually born in Odessa, Texas. And he was born as Jeffrey Vagel. He changed his name multiple times before settling on Hayim Cohen in 2010. And the only time he claimed to convert to this religion and not be born into it is when he requested to adopt a Jewish name in court. But all other times he said he was born and raised Jewish. He also stated that all nine of his adopted sons were born Jewish, but a lawyer said that that was false. Cohen has also made up stories about how these boys ended up in care at one point claiming a boy's parents died in a car crash, when in reality the dad had unalived himself and the mother had her rights taken away for several reasons. Cohen changed his adopted son's names and forced them to dress and act as if they were born Jewish. Apparently one person in the Orthodox community quickly realized that Cohen was a fraud and said that Cohen was Ted Bundy level sociopath. The children have also reported that he has been faking illnesses and disabilities, that he doesn't actually need a wheelchair, that he spit up fake blood in court. Apparently he was only released on bond for the 2019 case because he told the court he was in hospice for a terminal illness. I think a lot more things are going to come out about this man because mm. this hasn't even gone to trial yet. See, that's just a freaking disgusting case, man. The thing that got to me is, but he already got freaking caught once. You know, when they had freaking exchange doing it, they should have already been a radar then, man. They just let him keep his non freaking adopted sons after that. The system, bro. Like I said many times, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, man. To go on, for it to go on that long, that's just a damn shame, bro. Don't know who's gonna be doing these people minds, man, when they be doing stuff like that. And he faked his whole identity as well. Like he changed his name a dozen times, man. And made a whole fake backstory. Still to show you could fit in, man. Like I said, man, it's scary, bro. Like how you could just change your life. That's the blink of an eye, man. Nobody can know the true you, bro. Or your true backstory, true origins. Seekers. Be aware, man. Let's see this. Note, there's no evidence supporting this, and everything you're about to hear comes from former Area 51 employees. Oh. After Roswell, the government transported everything they found to Area 51 and put the media in a frenzy. They hired private investigators to watch and question the employees coming in and out of Area 51. Everyone would mention a project that would later be known as Project Abigail. It was rumored that the Nazis wanted to create a super soldier and it put pressure on other countries to do the same. In America, nobody wanted to have the experiment performed on them, so one of the scientists volunteered his daughter to be the guinea pig. This was the start of the scariest human experiment ever. They immediately started injecting her and shortly after, she started losing her hair and her bone structure began to change drastically Then she went completely insane. Her father committed suicide after seeing what he allowed his daughter to become. Shortly after, they decided to starve her to kill her. The next day she broke free and rampaged letting out a loud shriek, killed two guards and even bit one of their heads off and devoured them completely. The firing squad failed because the bullets didn't hurt her. She was eventually contained, and some say you can still hear her cries and scratches today. Some will say she actually escaped, and they like to avoid public panic, and she is still roaming the desert now. Ladies, this is why you Secret, should never let a nice guy make you feel bad for not wanting to be around him. Georgia Williams was a kind-hearted 17-year-old girl. She was still in school and wanted to be a medic in the army, but to make some money, she got a job working at a gas station. 
There is where she met 22-year-old Jamie Reynolds, who took a liking to her and incessantly asked her out. Georgia politely declined all of his advances, and he would text her all the time, and once he even tried to kiss her on the job. One day, he started telling her about how his true dream was to be a photographer, but he needed to get better before he could quit his day job. Mm. He asked Georgia if she could do him a favor and model for him. Georgia wanted to be nice and agreed to participate in his amateur photography. It's important to know that Georgia wasn't scared of Jamie. He never threatened or intimidated her. Instead, he made her feel bad for him because mm. manipulation comes in many different forms. Georgia said goodbye to her family one Sunday evening in May and left to walk to Jamie's house. She was under the impression that his parents would be home and that other models would be there. Several hours later, Georgia's phone texted her parents saying that since it was so late, she was just going to stay at a friend's. Her parents believed this, having no idea of the depravity that was happening just a few streets away. Her parents reported her missing the next day. Georgia's dad was also a member of the police force, so a lot of the officers investigating this knew her. Mm -hmm. Jamie had bought her this leather outfit, and then he also said he wanted to do photos that would simulate a hanging, so she would have a noose around her neck and be standing on a box, and the box would be removed in post. Mm -hmm. Jamie had other plans, and in fact, he kicked the box while Georgia was standing on it and took photos of her as she struggled. Police found around 40 photos of Georgia documenting her death and even more of the events that happened after. Jamie had done disgusting things to Georgia's corpse in various rooms throughout the house as documented in photos. Jamie's tastes were disturbing to say the least. He was really into snuff films and he had over 16,000 images and 72 videos of graphic and sexual acts. But this is what they found in his house and Jamie and Georgia were both missing. In the hours after the attack, Jamie put Georgia's body in the back of his van and even went to go see the Fast and the Furious 6 with her still in the car. A creepy detail is that a few days before her death, he asked if she wanted to go see it and she said that she already had plans to see it with her boyfriend. So he like kind of forced her to go to the movies with him. Mm. And after a while, he dumped her body in the woods. This led to a manhunt and they were able to catch him before he left the UK and Jamie Reynolds was sentenced to life in prison. In fact, police said that his planning and actions indicated that he was a serial killer in the making. This is Arthur. Seekers, bro. That case, man, it goes to show me how deep, I guess, manipulation, like she, like she said, how manipulation has different forms, bro. Like I said, he didn't make her feel unsafe and all that. He just made her feel sorry for him. And that's what drew her in. Damn, I just, it's a tragic case, bro. But hey, like, all the freaking things that he did to her, man, he took all those photos. It's, bro, man. Like, you do a freaking act like that, man. Then you just put possesses you to take pictures of it. Like, what? Gotta show you, man. You can never trust anybody, bro. She was just trying to be a good, I guess, friend to him, man. Made her feel sorry for him. And look what happened. Manipulation, like she said, see, because, man, manipulation comes in different forms. So we always got to be aware. Gary Bishop, a pedophile serial killer. Seriously, guys, the story is extremely disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. Mm. So Gary Bishop was born in Utah in the year 1952. And he was raised as a Latter-day Saint, or a very devout Mormon. And he was eventually an Eagle Scout. He had great grades. He was a pretty normal kid. Mm. But in February of 1978, he was arrested for embezzlement, and he was then excommunicated from the Mormon church. Mm. Now, this is interesting. When he was younger, he was in the Big Brother program in Salt Lake City, but he was eventually kicked out of that program after the directors found out that he had been assaulting young children. But eventually, Arthur would become responsible for the murders of five children. Mm. And it all started in the year 1979 with a four-year-old boy named Alonzo Daniels. So young Alonzo lived in the same apartment complex as Arthur, and Arthur lured him back to his apartment with the promise of free candy, but as we all know, free candy mm -hmm. is never a good sign. After Arthur attempted to assault young Alonzo, he dragged him into the bathroom, beat him on the head with a hammer, and then drowned him in the bathtub. After poor young Alonzo was dead, Gary then fondled the body, mutilated the boy's genitals, and buried the body in the desert. After the murder of Alonzo, Gary fulfilled himself by murdering puppies. Yes, this is something that he admitted to in later interviews. 
He said that the puppies whined just like four-year-old Alonzo did, so he would hit them in the head with hammers so that they would stop whining. Then, less than a year later, in 1980, he was introduced to a young boy named Kim Peterson. Mm. So young Kim was actually brought to Arthur by another boy nicknamed John. So according to John, he was being given money and toys by Arthur in exchange for boys that he could assault. And thus, wanting toys and money, young John offered to help Arthur lure young Kim mm. out to a place one night where Arthur could take advantage of the young boy. Sadly though, while they were on a walk, Arthur murdered Kim by shooting him three times. And sadly, after Kim was dead, Arthur then mutilated his corpse, took advantage of the body, and then buried it in the desert next to Alonzo's, his first victim. Mm. Arthur was questioned many times by the police about the disappearance of Kim, but he was never considered a suspect, and the police never gained any substantial evidence on him. Almost a year later, in 1980, Arthur then lured young four-year-old Danny Davis to his home after meeting him at a supermarket. Arthur and Danny played with toys for a while, but then at some point, Danny began to cry. And that's when Arthur attempted to silence the boy, but ended up strangling him to death, choking him with his own hand. After murdering the young boy, Arthur then drove his body out to the desert and buried it. But it should be noted that Danny Davis was the only victim that Arthur did not assault. After he disappeared, a number of shoppers at the supermarket that day gave descriptions about the guy who Danny Davis was last seen with, but police still had no leads. And this story only gets crazier and crazier, so follow for a part two. This is part two on the... Part two on it, man? It's like, he kept going back to back to back, seekers. I gotta find part two to do stories for y'all, man, so we can, like, finish out these cases, man. It's freaking insane, bro. Like, what type of freaking evil person does that, man? And I heard, like, he said he got another freaking young boy on it because he was giving him toys and money. It's like the freaking, you manipulated that boy, man, to doing those freaking heinous acts, bro. That's insane secrets, man. Truly. Goes to show you, bro. Like, bro, I'll tell you, man. Money is the root of all evil, bro. The things that it'll, it'll make people do, this freaking blows my mind. The case of an 18-year-old girl working at McDonald's who was strip searched by her manager and her manager's fiance. So oh. Officer Scott tells Walter to make Louise give him a BJ. How doing any of this relates to finding $50 doesn't make any sense. At this point, Louise has been inside this tiny cramped office for over three hours. She has no car keys, no phone, no clothes, nothing. She says she felt trapped, she felt numb, and she was scared of what Walter might do to her if she didn't listen. So because Louise feared for her life, she complied. After giving Walter the BJ, Walter buckles up his pants and leaves the McDonald's. He doesn't even tell Donna why he's leaving, he just hands her the phone, walks away, gets inside his car, and calls his friend and says, I did something bad. Walter knew that what he had just made Louise do was wrong. Why he complied? I don't know. After Walter leaves, Donna calls in an off-duty custodian named mm. Thomas and asks him to watch over Louise. Thomas starts speaking over the phone to Officer Scott, and Officer Scott tells him to remove Louise's apron and describe her body to him. As soon as Thomas heard this, he knew that this was wrong, and he hung up the phone and told Donna that this was fake. This was not a real police officer, and he called the real cops and waited for them to arrive. When police looked back at the surveillance footage, they couldn't believe that this was real. How did these people fall for something so stupid? Mm. Just because someone tells you to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. Yet Donna, Walter, and Kim went along with all of these commands from an Officer Scott. What's crazy is that this wasn't the first time that this had happened. These hoax calls had happened 73 times in over 31 states. Mm. Someone would call into the restaurant pretending to be a police officer investigating a crime, and he would make the managers at these restaurants perform these horrendous things. He would make these managers assault these young female employees, and the managers said that they went along with it because they genuinely thought that they were helping the police. It's crazy that this happened over 73 times and no one had caught the caller yet. Police work hard to track down the caller and they end up finding 38-year-old David Stewart. David Stewart was a husband, father of five correctionals officer that lived in Panama City, Florida. And when police were investigating the calls, they discovered that they came from prepaid calling cards purchased from a Walmart in Panama City. And when they went to go look at the surveillance footage at these Walmarts, David Stewart appeared. On June 30th, 2004, David was charged with solicitation of sodomy and with impersonating a police officer, which are both felonies. His trial began in October of 2006 and he pled not guilty. His lawyer claims that there's no evidence to prove that David made these phone calls. Just because he bought the calling cards doesn't mean that he made the call. After weeks of a trial and two hours of deliberation, the jury came back with the verdict. They found David Stewart not guilty. 
One thing to note is that since David was arrested, there have allegedly not been any more hoax calls. As for Donna, she was indicted on a charge of unlawful imprisonment and she served a year probation. As for her ex-fiance Walter, he was also charged and served five years in prison. Louise sued mm. McDonald's and won six million dollars. My heart goes out to Louise and to all of the victims in these hoax calls. She got hoax calls, man. That's the first time I've ever heard something like that, bro. Like, what the hell? 73 times, man. But they found him not guilty, man. But the freaking evidence was kind of right there because they said when he was no more causes coming in once that trial stuff was going on. So obviously, I guess he was the one behind it. But since he had that freaking prepaid card, man, like I said, I, I guess it's hard to track that. You can't technically really prove that was him. But it was right there, bro. And bro, to hear that he got off at the end, man. Like, bro, what possesses a person to do that? Call us a big cop and make them do those horrific acts, man. He was a correctional officer, too, almost so. Like, he knows the law. And he still chose to freaking do something like that, man. I'm telling you, bro, these people, bro, they do not think when they be before they do these actions, man. What do you guys think, Seekers? <laughs> Space. Guys, Seekers, man, if you guys made it with me to the end of the video, you're a real Seeker, man, Seeking the Truth. I greatly appreciate you, man, like I said. Um, guys, make sure you guys hit that like button, subscribe, hit that post notification bell so we can grow the Seekers, man. Uh, we we'll really appreciate the support. Like I said, guys, we're not missing a beat this day, man. I'm posting it every single day this month, bro. Like I said, hour-long videos. So, like I said, guys, be prepared, man. We're going to keep going. going to keep going strong. We're gonna grow the seekers, man. Like I said, I truly believe, man, we could grow this community into something special. We already hit a thousand. Let's keep going. You guys can catch in the next one. I'm out. Peace, seekers. 
What's up, YouTube? Welcome back, fellow seekers, man. You guys know what we do here on this channel, but we break down scary and creepy videos, man. On the net, on the web, from YouTube videos to TikTok videos to IG reels, anything weird, usually unexplained, you can find it right here on this channel. Like you say, we, we seeking the truth just like you. So um, thank you guys for um, tapping in with us, um, tapping in with the channel, subbing up to the um, channel. Really appreciate that. Found this video for you guys today, man. <sighs> Let's check it out. On that specific day, the neighbors heard the toddler scream and ran to help. They attempted to break into the home but had no luck. The neighbors watched outside from the window and recorded the incident on their phones. They witnessed Olivia naked, stabbing her daughter while singing the alphabet. After that, Olivia dismembered her two-year-old's body and began eating her liver. Once neighbors were able to get inside of the home, Olivia was passed out on the floor right next to her daughter's body. Authorities arrived minutes later and took Olivia into custody. Investigators suspected that Olivia had some sort of mental breakdown. Olivia's aunt stated that she had displayed odd behavior in the couple of days before the attack. Mm. Olivia had recently split up with her boyfriend of eight months and moved back in with her parents. Olivia later claimed that the stress of a broken relationship caused her to unalive her daughter and dismember her. Olivia was detained for 10 days and there is no information if there was an arrest made. I've said it before and I'll say it again, some people just don't deserve children. What this girl? Mm. Already a minute in, bro. Freaking sick to my damn stomach, man. But the head that the freaking like neighbors, but they had to record that on a phone, bro. Like they couldn't break into the house to help that freaking little girl. All they had to do was watch. The freaking whore, bro. Man. And they said because her freaking mind, because she had a broke, she had I guess a mental breakdown because she broke up with her boyfriend, bro. Dang relationships, man, can do to you. It's like, it's like, it's truly scary, bro. They can't really make or break a person, man. So, guys, what do you guys think about that, bro? Or did to herself will make you feel physically sick. This is one of the most shocking cases of psychosis I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. On February the 6th, 2018, Kaylee Muffart was using substances. She was high on M after a 48-hour binge. She ended up stumbling down the road next to a railway track. In her substance-induced state, she believed that she needed to save the world, and in order to do so, she needed to make a sacrifice. Horrifically, she believed that she needed to scrape her eyeballs out of her head or everybody would die. So that's exactly what she did. With her bare hands, she removed her own eyeballs. She then squashed them into her hands while a passerby struggled to restrain her. She was airlifted to hospital in South Carolina. She is now obviously completely blind, but thankfully is sober. She's a mother to a toddler and she wants to help people through them hearing her story. What was he saying? If that doesn't help people stay off, I guess, Amro, I don't know. I'm like, what the hell, bro? That definitely is one of the most craziest stories I ever heard. She like completely blinded herself, man. Tell me, bro, those substances, bro, they, they freaking when they mess with your mind, bro, and get your mind going, bro, it really makes you believe some some crazy things, man. I can't believe that I didn't make like national news story or something like that. You would think a story like that would be everywhere. Considering how freaking tragic it, it was. Hmm. What about that didn't happen? security footage from back in the 80s. This camera would just kind of generally face this hallway, but one night it caught something very eerie in this particular frame. If you look to the background mm -hmm. of this footage, on the right, there appears to be an elderly woman just standing there. What really kind of freaked everybody out is that everybody recognized this woman. The staff could tell that this was Blanche Raymond. The problem is, Blanche Raymond died two years earlier in 1984. Still, the consensus from the staff is that the footage clearly shows who they recognized to be this woman, just physically no explanation for it. You guys, this is freaking insane. insane. The remains of a child were found on January 10th in one of the storage lockers at this facility. So there were two people who had been renting out this storage locker at the King Storage Center in Pueblo, Colorado. They fell two to three months behind on their payments, so the owner evicted them. They had 48 hours to 
made the final payment and get all their stuff out. They didn't show up, but a family member did. And when they went in there to get, get everything out, they found a metal container that was full of hardened concrete. And when they opened it up, there were the remains of a child. So they called the police. The police talked to the owners. They said that the two people had rented that storage locker for quite a long time, but they couldn't think of like exactly how long it had been. Oh. But the plot thickens. In connection to this investigation, police are now asking for the public's assistance in locating these two children who haven't been seen since 2018. Their names are Jesus and Yesenia Dominguez. Police say that they should be about 10 and 9 years old now. Police have interviewed two persons of interest, but names haven't been released yet. They're asking for the public's assistance in finding those two kids, or if you have any information in what could have happened to the one in the metal container, here's their information. What makes a person do something tragic like that, bro? Like you thinking it's this freaking regular storage unit that family went to go, I guess, clean out their stuff, man, and if we can stumble upon that, bro, that's just freaking crazy, bro. Like imagine you going, I guess, clean trying to clean out a storage unit for I guess your family or something, you just find something like that, bro. It's gonna change your freaking whole life forever, man. I hear that it wasn't one, it was just two it was two, man. And they think it's a connection to those freaking two missing kids and 2018, bro. People, man, you gotta be, I guess, more aware, more aware nowadays, bro. Something should have been off, I guess, when they was asking about paying for that freaking, you know, unit, and they guess, and he wasn't trying to pay for it, bro. And it wasn't responding. That should have been a flag right there. Where's this guy? That has to be added, bro. I gotta call it like I see it. He held his dad's decapitated head in his YouTube video. January 30th of this year, 32-year-old Justin Nong has posted a video on YouTube blasting the federal government and Biden administration. That's when he held up what he claimed was his father's head. Justin claimed he was now the president of the United States and ranted against communists and globalists. Justin's mom had called police when she discovered her husband, Michael's body, inside the bathroom and he had no head. Police then recovered a large kitchen knife and machete from the bathtub. Mm -hmm. This was after finding Michael's head in a large plastic bag that was put in a cooking pot in a bedroom. Justin was arrested after taking off with his dad's car. Documents show that Justin will be charged with murder in the first degree, abuse of a corpse, and possession of an instrument of crime with him. This is one of the most... You should probably freaking take that video down with a freaking quickness, bro, because that's just, yeah, the freaking worst, man. And freaking two, you know, we obviously, YouTube wouldn't allow that on a freaking platform, man. But here, something like that over freaking politics, bro, it's like, bro, people nowadays, man, you just can't have a disagreement with somebody. You can't, like, and when it comes to politics and things like that, bro, I said, I'm trying not to even get involved like that because it just causes a whole freaking big argument. One person trying to put it aside, and they can just. You can clash very wrong, but when something bad can happen, man. Damn, bro. His own dad, too? What the f? And I'm all gonna sum up on that, bro. Seekers, bro. This world is getting crazy nowadays. No, the world is crazy, bro. Stay well, aware. Some tragic workplace accidents, so you might want to hear this. In October 2012, a 62 year old employee at Bumblebee Foods named Jose Molina was having a normal day in the Bumblebee facility in California. In his schedule, Jose was tasked with performance maintenance on a 11 meter long industrial oven, so he went inside on one of the oven tanks. Believing that Jose was in the bathroom, one of his co-workers actually shut the tank's door and then filled the entire oven with 5,400 kilograms of tuna and then turned the oven on. A search ensued when the manager noticed Jose was missing, but by then it was way too late. They found Jose's body two hours later inside of the oven. The temperature inside the oven reached 270 degrees Fahrenheit. And Jose was unfortunately cooked alive inside of the tank with all of the fish. And you can only imagine how horrific this death actually was. Could you imagine just being cooked alive and then being crushed by tens to hundreds of pounds of fish? 
mixed with the smell, the texture, the heat, this death was just awful. The company Bumblebee and two managers were actually charged for this death, mm -hmm. and the company got off with a six million dollar settlement. But what do you think? Do you think six million is way too low for a death like this and accident? Many people believe it should have been more towards fifty million. But yeah, this death is absolutely awful, and I can't believe this happened to poor Jose. I wonder how many freaking companies, bro, they've been getting off like that. Like, you know, freaking tragedy, something happens, and they just, oh, we're just gonna pay them off, man. We, you just pay them off, it, it'll go away. But yeah, like something like that. How people say, yeah, only six million. I mean, obviously, you would want freaking Jose to be alive, but man, six million, bro. I think a couple like Bumble Me, like, man, like I said, I agree with them, man. 50 million, bro, like, nah, you have to up that, bro. Like, that was, that was a man's life, man. And because it's freaking manager, bro wasn't paying attention just gonna close it like he didn't even check he just closed it in on him people bro <laughs> affect that with people man when you when you do it when you do your job poorly bro see because what do you guys think man six million or that 50 or 50 million bro i ain't gonna lie they have to go up these companies can't get away with that The man in that video was murdered in broad daylight. His name was Matima Miller, otherwise mm -hmm. known as Swavy or Babyface S here on TikTok. Before Swavy was shot and killed in broad daylight, he had amassed over two and a half million followers here on TikTok. Swavy posted life updates all the time. He posted dancing videos. He was just a really positive TikToker that loved being creative. And obviously this had attracted tons of people to his page, but nobody ever could have expected what happened next. So in July of 2021, on a Monday at around 10.42 a.m., police were called to a neighborhood in Wilmington, Delaware. When police arrived at the scene, they found Swaby laying on the ground with a gunshot wound. At the time, Swaby had literally been out on the street when somebody drove up, started firing shots, and killed him. So for the longest time, nobody had any idea who had killed Swaby. That is, until November of 2021, when Israel Lecompte was indicted. Israel, who was just 18 years old at the time, was indicted on 38 felony charges. Prosecutors gave him 10 counts of possession of a firearm during a felony, two murder charges, so he killed two individuals. And he had been a part of a gang called the North Pack Street Gang in Delaware. Now, I couldn't find any more updates to this case, but this is just a tragic, tragic story, an event that never needed to happen in the first place. And rest in peace, Swaby. I know I look in town. So was this a random act, bro? About game violence, man? Like, imagine, bro. It's like, you can't even just be out on the street nowadays. You could just be out on the street, money and business. Somebody come along just try to freaking end it all, man. And then broad daylight, too, bro. And hey, that he was only 18. Like, bro, his life was just freaking starting, bro. And he did the tragedy act, and now his life, his life is over, bro. People don't think before they act nowadays, man. And that's the result of it, bro. Seekers, bro. <laughs> Gotta be aware, man. You have to be, bro. In a world like this, it's sad but true, bro. I'm like a crazy person, but I'll never apologize for sticking up for my babies and fighting for what's right. <laughs> Lifetime and Gilbert had my kids in their custody today for their summer camp. My six-year-old came home and told me that two other six-year-olds were in the bathroom under their supervision, taking inappropriate pictures in their swimsuits and pulling their swimsuits down to reveal themselves, sending them on their phones to another person and that person responding, delete these pictures, don't tell anybody or we can't be friends. Tell me that's another child. That's why I'm sitting here at Lifetime and Gilbert because we filed a police report. Now we have to wait wait for the warrant and i'm just supposed to go home lifetime won't tell the parents to come bring the phone here so that we can get to the bottom of it the police can't do anything without a warrant and i just i went live i didn't know what else to do i still don't know what to do i feel like i'm losing my mind it's freaking crazy bro but she's standing up for her justice for her freaking kids you gotta freaking nothing but respect bro like something like that happened i was a year like i said no other six years when i say delete the pictures or we can't be friends obviously there's somebody probably in that freaking facility that um who's ever watching those kids but one of them took advantage of them and, and now is trying to freaking cover their tracks said so the police can't do enough without the warrant though man 
I feel like there has to be like a better net assistant they need to put in place because if some ha if somebody have like hardcore evidence, bro, and they just can't wait because they had the war, man. Something else needs to happen, man, because you can't let them get away. You ju you just can't. So the world ended in twenty twenty one. So are we in a simulation or something now? I got lost in the forest when I was three years old and was forever changed. Hello, my name is Riker Webb. In 2022, I was playing with my dog in my yard in Montana when I heard a strange sound going me into the forest. It didn't take long for me to get lost, and after a couple hours, my parents noticed I was gone. They started sending search parties to look for me. I walked two and a half miles before I found an abandoned shed to hide in from the thunderstorm. But there was someone hiding with me. After two days, I was found by a nearby couple who heard some weird sounds coming from their shed. But when they found me, I wasn't the same. The clothes I was wearing when I went missing were completely different than I was found in. And after being through such a traumatic experience, Going without food or water for two days, I looked like a completely different person. Please. But this is all because... Stop brushing your teeth. Mm. Stop brushing your teeth. Wow. Brushing your teeth is bad. All right, let me explain. 99% of people in this generation use plastic toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. You may say, what is the problem with that? Plastic toothbrushes have nylon bristles, which contain microplastics. Every time you brush your teeth, millions of microplastic bits enter your system. This usually causes cancer and leads to a worse life. If you want to avoid this, then you can use a more natural alternative. What I recommend is using something called a Miss Wax Stick. This stick originated from nature and is a more natural and healthy way of brushing your teeth. It contains zero microplastics and makes your teeth whiter in just a matter of days. I said way too much in this video. Now it is up to you to change your lifestyle habits. I better go now before they take me down for sharing this kind of information. Hmm. What the hell? Microplastics on the damn toothbrush, bro? You know, everybody freaking uses a plastic toothbrush, you know. So, man, he really freaking, freaking, like, shocking my freaking reality, freaking blowing it up, man. Like, what the hell? I wonder why they, they didn't freaking, like, you know, make that freaking, I guess, maybe something public or that, I guess, brushing teeth is bad for you. It depends on the type of toothbrush you got, or you have to get used the natural way, man. I'm gonna have to freaking, I'm probably about to switch that up, but like I said, man, when, you, when I watch these videos, what you guys seek as well, I'm, I'm always learning new information, man. And it's always up to you guys, like I said, to take the information and do what you guys want with it. Like I said, don't believe what I say, don't believe what the video says. It's up to you guys, man. That two brushes, bro. Seekers, tell me down below, man. Do you guys use plastic two brushes, bro? Oh no. Let's talk about skin mm. They are said to be powerful witches and medicine men. They can even change their form to any animal they desire, including humans. But they mainly change into deer, wolves, and coyote. You know, dragon fruit ain't that good. The scary part is they say if you see one, they can steal your face and even your last scream for help. You might think this is like a folklore or a tale. People actually believe these are real. The scary part is there's actual videos of people seeing oddly walking humans screaming help in the middle of nowhere. See, they say skinwalkers pretend to be humans in distress, and if they're calling out for help, they're just trying to lure you in. Ashley, that's when they take your life and use your voice and your look to catch their next gullible victim. A man's wife wasn't even home, but yet somebody was calling him to come downstairs in his wife's voice. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Hell no. If you want me to go out in the middle of the field, at least shape shift into like Rihanna or Beyonce. I'm making a mess, but this look good. I'll be there in a minute. 30 seconds flat. Naked. Very naked. Maybe even Lizzo. Let's light this candle. Skinwalkers. It's kind of hard to get into, but. See, cause do you guys believe, man, there's some skinwalkers among us, bro? I don't know if we can run into some woods, bro. Like I said, like you said, they take. The faces, man, the voices, bro. Saying like I seen heard a couple, you know, those clips saying help me. And there was nobody else around man. so that's kinda ske sketchy and iffy, bro. I don't know, skinwalkers, bro. Sound freaking terrifying, bro. I found her. Edit. What the hell is that? She stabbed her boyfriend with a rainy syringe for looking at other women. November mm -hmm. 2023, 44-year-old Sandra Jimenez got into a fight with her boyfriend of eight years. This was an ongoing argument of him looking at other women. That specific day, her boyfriend was lying on the couch, and that is when Sandra jumped on top of him and stabbed him with both two needles, and one had pierced his right eye. These needles that she was using was actually supposed to be used for their dogs to help vaccinate them against rabies. Once Sandra did this, she fled the scene and her boyfriend called 911. Her boyfriend was then transported to a hospital in Miami and he gave the police a description of what his girlfriend looked like as well as what her vehicle looked like. Police found Sandra sleeping in her car and she was taken into custody. Sandra told police that her boyfriend's injuries were self-inflicted and she pled not guilty. Sandra is now facing an aggravated battery charge and her bond is set at $7,500. She just can't tell the truth. It was carrying 45 passengers. It had 19 rugby players, and it included like, the family members and the crew members and stuff. And crashing into the Andes Mountains, they crashed because there was a lot of turbulence. Apparently, mm. what happened is they were like, gentlemen, put your seatbelts on, expect turbulence. Out of nowhere, it felt like wind like slapped the fuck out of the plane. The plane started shaking, and the pilot didn't calculate the landing bump because of the bad weather. This all took place in like 17. Days. This whole time it's obviously not cold. Negative twenty five degree yeah, bro. Obviously they start eating with their friends and friends, bro. Yeah, friends they're they're yeah. friends and family, bro. Yeah. Closer to the end when they're about to get rescued. Two guys, Roberto and Roberto. They decide to hike. It was three of them at first. Mm. Try to go as far as possible. They get to the top of the mountain. One of them starts coming down with no type of like equipment and shit. And he tells them like we got up to the mountain finally guys, but all we saw was mountains after mountains after mountains. Both of them are saying that they're gonna go until they die. They end up hiking for 38 miles, 10 days to reach out. Mm -hmm. That's a little important fact with that, bro. So, Nando, the one that was on the hike, he was in a coma for the first few days. Doctors were saying the only reason he survived was because they put him in the coldest part of the plane. So, I guess the coldest. Lowered the swelling of his brain. Lowered the of his brain. So, he ended up surviving that. And then he was the first one who said, if it comes down to it, I'm gonna eat the dead people. He didn't care. Also, whenever they had to go hike, the last two or last bodies remaining was his mom and his sister. And he couldn't eat. But you know what's crazy? What he said in real life, if I don't come back, I give him permission to be my mom and my sister. And the crazy part is, is that on the 70th day, it's my weekend. He has a dream that. We're the reason you should. Man. See, because could you guys imagine that more? You freaking plane freaking crash and then freaking on the mountains, man. And they just freaking. You know, it's in a cold day, I have no freaking, no food, no shelter, man. So they just had to, to start freaking eating the freaking dead people, bro. What the hell? And they had to climb that mountain, man, I guess, to see the terrain, see where they were at. But it was just mountains after mountains, man. And they just said, we got to keep going, bro. They had a hike for like 38 miles, man. 10 days straight. Could you guys do that, Seekers? Ooh. Freaking things, man. People, when they be surviving these freaking tragic events, bro, you know, it forever changes them. Forever. There's no way around that. Should not come to Alaska. Hello. Chills like this one. I'll tell you this picture that I sourced. It came from the Outerwood Bed and Breakfast, that's located in Louisiana, and it was taken by this woman right here, Meredith Den, and sent to her husband. It's the middle of the night, and she's hearing things down the hallway, so she took this picture and sent it to her husband, not even realizing what she caught in the background of this photo, she captured something that most people find very difficult to 
this one. If you look top left of the photo, there is a figure that is watching her from the stand. And it's not even clear from this photo if what she captured was an actual person who was watching her, because I, I feel like she would have seen them. But I don't know, the closer you get to this photo, the more unnerving it becomes, because it almost looks like somebody with their full jaw unhinged. Yeah, they definitely do, bro. I wonder what people be thinking when they be looking back in those pictures and seeing those freaking terrifying pictures, bro. They can't sense their presence. They can't sense their presence there or something. Not an edit. I gotta call out our house here. This woman jumped off a top floor balcony to escape her jealous boyfriend. 28 year old Amy Beckley had been dating 28 year old footballer Shaquille McDonald for about six weeks. Shaquille played professional football for clubs such as Derby County and Coventry. Mm. She said that in the first few weeks of them dating, he loved bond her and showered her with affection. She was a single mum and really appreciated having someone looking after her and caring for her. However, she saw a completely different side to him when they were on a night out in March 2023. They'd been out in Arcadian in Birmingham when he accused her of speaking to a bouncer. He snatched her phone and keys and called her derogatory names and made her get in a taxi with him. In the taxi, he put her in a headlock, bit her, scratched her, and slapped her. After they got home, CCTV captured him launching another vicious attack at her. He smashed her into a concrete wall, dragged her inside, and strangled her repeatedly. Mm. She lost consciousness, and he left the room. When she came to, she tried to ring 999 on silent. However, she became so terrified of him that she jumped 14 foot from her top floor balcony to escape him. She broke both arms in doing so. Now, luckily, her fall was broken slightly by a balcony below hers, and someone had been outside having a cigarette mm. at the time. They helped her inside and got her some help. Police arrived, and Shaquille tried to flee, but was detained. Amy was in an absolutely horrific state. You can see the images on Google if you want to go and look at those, but they are really shocking. Shaquille was jailed for just two years and eight months after admitting to actual bodily harm and strangulation. Let's talk about one of the creepiest moments. Like, what the hell, bro? People, man. They get freaking jealous or something, bro. Like, it just freaking flips, switching them, bro, that they can't turn off, and it just turns into a freaking completely different person. In the beginning, he was shining with love and attention. He thought she was talking to a bouncer, man. He just flipped and changed it to a freaking completely different person. And she had to go to that extreme, bro, to escape, man. Broke both her arms and doing so, but she freaking made it, bro. The he only got jail for like two years or something, man. I don't know about that, man. Like, he's probably out now, and you never know if he could try to do it again or something, bro. People, bro. Gotta be aware, man. You gotta truly, I guess, know a person before you get into a relationship with him. It's in American TV history, the Joanna Lopez broadcast. But before we watch the video in its full and comfortable length, let's break down what happened. On January 14th, 1989, NBC Chicago was doing its early Saturday broadcasting, several PSA segments including an anti-drug campaign, a meditation segment, and a sign-off segment from WMAQ-TV Chicago. Mm. Then after that, they cut to a national anthem segment, but then in the middle of the national anthem segment, it abruptly cuts off and it shows this. <laughs> Seekers, very weird. And yeah, there's no transition, there's no sound, there's nothing. It's just this picture for 20 seconds of a girl named Joanna Lopez, a missing banner, and a phone number to call. Hmm. And a lot of people got creeped out by this. Like this guy said, this is like a real life analog war. And this other person said that it's terrifying because of the low quality of the image and the lack of information and silence. Basically, it just freaked everybody out. But well, listen guys, this isn't just like some analog for this podcast was legit. Like it actually happened. But what we don't know is if she was ever found, if Joanna Lopez was ever found. So if you guys know anything, let me know in the comments or if you guys have any thoughts, let me know. Cause that picture's terrified. That's a bad pick of her. That we wouldn't have been able to find her with that pick. Um so I'm just curious. Let me know. Let me know. This is by far one of the most disturbing, pick, bro. Accidents caught on camera explained. 
In 2014, a terrible accident occurred at an amusement park in Orlando, Florida, resulting in the death of a 14-year-old boy. The incident took place at Orlando's Icon Park, where the freefall ride stands as the world's tallest freestanding drop tower, towering at a height of 430 feet. The victim, Tyree Sampson from St. Louis, Missouri, slipped out of his seat during the ride. The primary cause of the accident was an operator error. The operator manually adjusted the seat restraint opening to accommodate Tyree's weight, which was over 300 pounds. As a result, the restraint opening was nearly double the normal range. During the ride's descent, Tyree slipped through the gap between the seat and the harness and tragically fell to the pavement, suffering mm -hmm. fatal injuries. The autopsy revealed that Tyree had numerous broken bones and internal injuries. His weight exceeded the ride's manual weight limit of 287 pounds. Now I'm going to explain the heartbreaking video. So if you've ever been on these rides, you know how they work. It slowly brings you up to the top and then it drops you down and then you stop kind of halfway when you get to the bottom. Mm. But as the ride slowed and came down, the momentum of it stopping threw Tyree out of his seat and you see him being flung to the ground at a pretty fast speed. And seconds later, you hear his body hit the pavement floor. And it might be one of the most disturbing sounds you will ever hear. The best way I can describe it is the sound of a watermelon hitting the concrete from a high up distance and just exploding all over the place. You hear the disturbing splatter sounds and the bones breaking. And you also hear the sound of the blood coming back and hitting the ground after the initial hit meaning that poor Tyree's body just exploded. The video is absolutely disturbing, and as always, I do not recommend looking it up. I just thought I'd include it to give you guys some context. But nonetheless, this heartbreaking incident highlights the importance of strict safety protocols and proper operator training in amusement parks to prevent such tragedies in the future. This is just so sad and heartbreaking. Tyree was so young. May he rest in peace. This is how a family's Got to, man. These freaking operators, bro. Like, who freaking operating those rides? Like, roller coasters or drops or whatever, you know, the little spinning thing, man. You gotta be freaking, you have to do your job, man, to a T because my people's lives depend on it, bro. I remember, like, that's what I said. Sometimes I'm kind of iffy on roller coasters, bro. I remember sometimes, man, like I said, bro. I'll be, I remember sometimes I like had to, I think I actually had to tell operator, man, like, can you check my freaking, you know, seat or something to make sure I was properly shot in? Because I said, they ain't. If I ride something like that, man, and I'm making sure they do their job, cause I can't, I'm, I don't want to go out like that, bro. That's insane, bro. Man. Whew. Seekers, what do you guys think about that? The celebration ended in murder. It was the 10th of December, 2003. The Whitaker family were living in Houston, Texas, and included parents Kent and Trisha, along with their sons, 19-year-old Kevin and 23-year-old Bart. They were described by neighbors as the perfect family. They decided to go out for food that evening at a seafood restaurant. They were out to celebrate Bart's pending graduation from university, and they'd actually bought him a $4,000 Rolex mm. to congratulate him. Just after returning home, the family of four would become a family of three. Neighbor Brandon Stanley was sat at his computer when he heard gunfire. He quickly rang police to alert them and ran over to the property to see what the commotion was. He found the dad, Kent, lying on the ground with a gunshot wound to his chest. Brandon's dad also ran over to help and helped Kent apply pressure to the wound and luckily he survived. Inside of the property, Bart also rang emergency services and he said he'd been shot in the shoulder and had chased an unknown assailant out of the house. Tragically, his brother Kevin lay dead on the floor. Mum, Trisha, had also been shot and she was rushed to hospital by a helicopter. She unfortunately passed away while she was receiving treatment. Mm. Kent received medical treatment from the hospital and Bart also received treatment for his non-life-threatening injuries. The whole community was absolutely terrified, obviously, thinking that there was an unknown killer on the loose. However, when police investigated the crime scene, it didn't look as though they would expect. No expensive items had been taken and it just didn't seem like a typical burglary. Mm. Drawers and doors had been opened, but it seemed like they'd been kind of systematically opened, not done in a frenzy like so? normal with house invitations. They also discovered that the gun used in the killings was a gun from inside of the house that had been kept in a safe. Whoever was responsible for the murders knew exactly where the gun was and how to get it out of the safe. When questioned by police, Bart stated that it was very dark, so he didn't see much. Mm. And he was also really vague about very important details. 
Investigators soon discovered that Bart was in fact not going to be graduating at all and he lied about it. His history was also concerning and there had been a police report filed about Bart after he'd spoken to somebody about wanting to kill his dad. Then a former roommate of Bart called Adam Hip also reported that Bart had once said to him that he wanted to hire him to kill his family so that he could inherit their fortune. Police then looked into two of Bart's co-workers, Chris Fischier and Stephen Champagne. Stephen initially denied any knowledge of anything, but then gradually admitted to more and more. A year after the murders, he finally confessed to being hired by Bart to kill the family. Chris was the shooter and had been lying in wait for the family while they had their meal. Bart actually went on the run at this point and was tracked down eventually 18 months after the murders in Mexico. He was extradited back to the US to face prosecution. Chris and Stephen cooperated with the investigators and Chris got life and Stephen got 15 years. Bart was actually sentenced to death, but in a dramatic turn of events, just half an hour before he was due to be executed, they actually commuted his sentence. Mm. He was then given life without parole. Damn, bro. The freaking things like a silver in these videos never fail the things people would do for money, man. Like, bro, well, he really wanted to. He hired, like, damn man, like hitmans, bro, to take out his family, man, just for some money. And because he, I guess, didn't graduate, he, he wanted to have that as well, bro. Like, man, bro, his own freaking mom and brother, bro. Freaking gone, man. All because he wanted to inherit, inherit his family's money and be, I guess, the last one standing, bro. I was like, the people things to do for money, bro, it's disgusting, bro, truly. Seekers, that's it for this video for you guys today, man. Like I said, when we watch these videos together with you guys, man, like I said, don't believe what I say. Don't believe what the video say. Always do your own research, man, Like just like I have to do as well. I just wanted to thank you guys, man, for the support you guys been showing on these past couple of videos. Guys making me believe in myself, man. You guys were growing the seekers, man. We're trying to build a real community. So I really appreciate you guys' support. You guys can catch you in the next one. Peace, seekers.